You're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Challenge us at Wexford Insurances, 0818 31 30 30. I'm now joined in studio by the author of a new business book, Small Steps. Paul McNeve, you might start by telling me a bit about your own background, please. Sure. Well, I'm a pretty average background from Bray. Uh, went to school in St. David's Greystones, did the leaving when I was 17, quite a young 17. And uh, I got a job, I saw an ad in the newspaper for trainee surveyor in Hamilton Osborne King, did a couple of interviews, got the job and started out a bit naively, not realising that I had to do a chartered surveying degree at night by correspondence course, which you can't do anymore. But that was a that was tough. And that's how I started out and got into the business. At the age of 20, something tragic happened. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, I was working away very much in the apprentice mode. You know, did two years of delivering letters around Dublin city centre, making the coffee, putting up the signboards, all of that. And had just been promoted up to the ground floor and you were uh, taking a few inquiries and placing ads and the basics. And uh, I woke up on the 11th of December 1982 in the Burns unit of Stevens Hospital which is uh, down beside Houston Station. It's now the HSE headquarters. And I had been in a car accident the night before. The car had gone on fire. I had been very badly burned and had lost all of the skin from my legs. Uh, would, would have been the worst of it. My hands were badly burnt and some other light burns elsewhere. But my legs had got the worst of it. To put that in place for some people, they might, uh, most of the fellow patients around me were survivors of the stardust which had happened the previous year, and there were some were still there. So it was not a nice place to be when you were 20, and it became my home for the next four months or so. And how long were you out of work for at the time? Well, in total, between the Burns unit there and uh, then eventually the Re- National Rehabilitation Hospital in Dunleary, which did a fantastic job on me, getting me going again, uh, I was out of, out of work for about a year. So all of the, I suppose, the effects of that were physical, but what mental impact did it have on you? Well, it was huge. I suppose the the, the, the the major disaster that came from the whole thing was that both my legs had to be amputated eventually after months of agonising skin grafts and infections and anointments. And, uh, you know, it was pretty horrific stuff. And eventually as a life-saving procedure in February 83, my right leg was amputated above the knee and a few days later, my left leg was amputated below the knee. So that was obviously, I mean, for a 20-year-old, a massive shock. And I wonder sometimes still, how did I cope with it? But uh, with the help of my family and my friends, you know, that's when you discover who your friends are. It's not the people who come in and see you once. It's the people who come in and see you every day for for a year. So tell me, after 18 months, you went back to work. What was that like? It was exciting because one of, I found one of the first great motivations I had uh, that the, the hospital in Dunleary got me up and walking again on artificial legs. And I was just driven by this motivation to get back to work. I think a very natural thing, you know, would I be able to support myself? And I was so lucky in that the firm now Savills, they kept my job open for me. They paid me for over a year when I was out of work. Now, that was pretty visionary for its time. I wasn't earning a fortune, but it still uh, it was very positive. It meant I could buy a car when I came out of hospital, so good basic help. They were very positive about coming back, organised car spaces. Computers had just been invented in Ireland in 1983, 84. So the first computer had arrived into the office, and the idea was that I would kind of work this and... Uh, I did for about an hour and then I got bored and uh, really just by being enthusiastic and and taking on every single little job I could get, I set out to try and get back to to normal. You then progressed to becoming Managing Director of HOK. How did that come about? Well, um, a slight surprise to me at the time. I mean, I had become an Associate Director, then a Director. And this was a large, very successful company, as it still is. A group of my my fellow directors asked me would I consider taking over when uh, Aidan O'Hogan was the then managing director. We had a company rule, a bit like the presidential race. You could only do two four-year terms. Aidan was coming to the end of his. Uh, 
someone was well, the job was open again and I was asked to do it and I did. In 2007 you successfully sold HOK to Savills for over 15 million euros. Mm. How did that deal come about? Savills had put a few shots across our bows over 10 years or so. Uh, Aidan O'Hogan who was the MD at the time uh, was was pally enough with Jeremy Helsby who who is now the chief executive of the Savills Worldwide and that connection really was 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 what got it going because uh, I'm sure it started with a, a conversation which led to a meeting which led to clandestine meetings in Heathrow Airport and Dublin Airport and hotels and due diligence for six months and eventually the deal was done uh, in you know the usual dramatic fashion at about five a.m. in a lawyer's office everything was signed so the timing of it seems idyllic was it. I suppose it's something that was brought about by luck or was it something where you had the foresight to see what was happening in the future property market? It was largely luck, uh, the timing, because we were going to, you know, we knew we had to cement an alliance with an international firm and before too long. So that was a strategic goal we had to do that. So whether the market had been uh, half what it was, we still would have done it. Uh, so that was the imperative um, at the time, that was in '06. That deal was done. Uh, there were there were signs of uh, the market was cooling, and it, we, everyone was welcoming that. When everyone was talking about a soft landing, as as were we, but so was the central bank. The SRI was talking about robust economic growth into the medium term. Nobody saw, uh, you know, coming what happened. Uh, so. None of those factors drove it, but uh, we were going to do it anyway. Uh, but it was there was a slice of everything in it, I suppose. As you say, HOK was a very profitable company, especially in the estate agency market at the time. And I suppose one question I have for you, Paul, is that how did it become such a premium brand? I know you focused earlier on customer service, but apart from that, what did you do better than anyone else in the market? Ah, uh, well, there's a, that's a big question. Um, there was a there's a long legacy. The firm was there a long, long time and was run by, you know, chartered surveyors, uh, relatively conservatively. But the firm was seen as being absolute, um, you know, blue chip firm, very safe pair of hands. The banks loved the firm. You know, the accountancy people, the the receivers. You know, you just you couldn't go wrong, and you couldn't be seen to be going wrong. You weren't taking a chance. So. When you had that reputation and you employed staff of that caliber, uh, which we always tried to do, a you can charge a slight premium in your fees, so your income re you know reflects that, so it does pay for itself. But when the firm became became more modern, I suppose there was just a generational change. I think we held on to those values. I mean, the firm never had an overdraft in in my living memory, uh, so that's pretty conservatively run, but. Uh, we held on to those uh, that element of conservatism, conservatism, I suppose, but uh, you know we were very fast out of the traps. We were, you know, across Europe, we had a hundred acquisitions done in the UK uh, for Irish investors before anyone else had done one. You know, it was something like that kind of level. We had moved staff into offices in the UK. We had moved staff into Germany. You know, that we were. Uh, and that wasn't all, you know, that was other people's vision. Uh, Liam Lenehan, a colleague of mine, ex-colleague of mine, was ahead of his time in a lot of that. So we were out there, there was an, a hungry group of people and uh, combined with never letting the standards drop on service, which, which was my calling card, it was, a, it was a strong mixture. Paul, you mentioned that HOK was held in high esteem with the other stakeholders within the industry itself, such as the accountants and the banks and everything else. How did that come about? It's a question of track record. I think it's as simple as that. You know, uh, if you're, you're you're known as a firm for doing the right thing, for not taking shortcuts, as as having high professional standards, and sticking to them, and and never never dropping your guard or or taking an easy way out, and over time, you know that that enhances your reputation, and you build it up, and. For example, you know, I, I well remember when I was managing director, 
a common problem we would have when when extraordinarily high prices were being paid, for example, for building land by a developer client of ours who would go and pay whatever, 30 or 40 million for land. And they, they would then come to us to do a valuation for their bank so that they could borrow the money. And uh, it would go to our valuation department and they would come down to me and say, listen, we can't make it worth more than 22 million or something. And then the new homes department uh, would come and say, this client is going to withdraw all their business and they won't give us the houses they build on this land unless we do this valuation. Uh, and we never did. So we would lose that business and we did lose business like that. And uh, that business went out the door and went to other firms who would value it at a higher level. Uh, so you've got to stick to your values and we did and that pays off in the long run. So Paul, tell me about the next chapter of your life. I left the property business. Uh, I had to spend a little bit of time recuperating and getting, you know, in fact some months again back in the wheelchair. But the doctors were right. And once I had it properly healed, then it's it's been perfect ever since. So one obvious thing that you can do when I was in the wheelchair was to write. So I had always had this dream of writing a thriller. And I wrote uh, a thriller which took me, the, you know, probably 18 months on and off and worked hard at it. And but I have I, and I've about 100, at least 100 rejection letters from publishers and agents. And I keep redoing it and going back and I'll get there. But I was telling a pal of mine that I see from time to time over a coffee about this thriller I was writing. And he said to me, as only old pals can, well, Paul, if you don't mind me saying, he said, you're writing the wrong book. What you should be writing is the story of your life and your views on business and customer service and all of those things that you hold dear. And he, it, it hit home because I thought about it and in fact he was right. So I sat down and I started writing Small Steps, which is my new book. And I wrote that over perhaps over a year and the first publisher that I went near with it grabbed it. And it has been a great success. It's only launched, Nora Casey launched it for me in town in Dublin last, about three or four weeks ago. And I was thrilled it got to number three in the Nielsen bestsellers last week so and it's been selling very well and uh, that's another little that's another chapter and uh, so alongside that really what I'm doing now mostly is working a lot speaking at seminars things like the Spiegel tent event speaking at uh, company events workshops training uh, and I have retainers if you like with large one large accountancy firm uh, and a company in the insurance sector where I would go in every month and do work with them on really strategic thinking. They see me as a, an outside view, just I'm in there to shake things up a bit, would sit in on strategy meetings uh, because companies, I think, can't see the wood for the trees sometimes and it's a, it's a great thing to have an outside view and it's amazing what you can see. Uh, so I, I do that and I enjoy it and uh, really for the next six months now I think it will be pretty much full on with uh, promoting full step, uh, small steps and uh, doing motivational speaking work because that has suddenly got very, very busy for me with the uh, the publicity surrounding the book and I've quite a bit on in the next few months. So enjoying that and uh, looking forward to the next chapter after that. So Paul, as you say, you've just released Small Steps, your new book, um, aimed at the business community. Share with me maybe three tips that readers can expect to get from the book itself. Okay, well, the the, the title in itself is one of the themes of the book. Um, I went through years of corporate think tanks with various companies, and I still see it now. Everyone brainstorms and there's flip charts and arrows and grand plans and objectives and key goals. Uh, written down and then stuffed into files at the end of the day and everyone goes away and two weeks later no one knows what the company's objectives are. I keep it much simpler. Just as I was taught in rehabilitation, you string together a series of small steps. Each step may look so small that it's insignificant, but if you consistently put them together, they quickly and powerfully add up to something that you can achieve that you would never have dreamed of. And I implemented that and I give examples in the book of how I implemented that in business. A second 
lesson is is the core value the the, the primacy of service as the strategy um, it's the only option I say to companies all companies look the same to their customers and this is a, a failing companies have most companies when I go into a sector I speak to a company that there's, there's an automatic overestimation of their own service they think they're a little bit better than the other guys and they never really are the opportunity is that they're all clustered together there's very, very rarely an outstanding performer in any sector. The opportunity is just to tweak the dial. If everyone else is at seven, tweak the dial to eight and a half and keep it there. Then you're outstanding. It's the only strategy. And, you know, you can reduce costs to gain volume. Your competitors, if you did the right thing, your competitors will copy you and you've lost any advantage. You can invest a lot of money in IT to be a little quicker or sharper. If you did the right thing, your competitors will copy you. If you implement a plan of small steps to outservice your customer, your outservice your competitors, your competitors can't react. They don't know what's happening. They just see you winning more business. They see you winning their clients. They see their staff starting to go to you. Uh, eventually, they hear from someone, oh, yeah, they've a service strategy, but they can't react. They can't come in. The MD can't come in on Monday and say, we're upping our service 40%. It doesn't work. It's a, it's a cultural thing that takes a lot of work and empowering each individual in the, in the firm to know and to take personal responsibility for their actions almost every second of every day that they're working, that you go out there and dazzle the clients uh, and act like a canary is the phrase I use in the book. Uh, so that's that's a second lesson service and a third um, I would I, I would put down as you know a phrase that's really annoying me at the moment is uh, I hear it all the time uh, everything happens for a reason I'm hearing that all over the place all day every day everything happens for a reason usually done to shrug off something that hasn't worked out we didn't get that job we didn't you know something went wrong and the reason is usually that the person didn't do much to make it happen any other way. That's usually the reason. And I find I don't like that phrase, everything happens for a reason, because it acknowledges a helplessness that I don't believe in and that I don't acknowledge, because I think individuals and as companies and as groups, we can influence uh, our own outcomes and as groups and influence people around us and our markets much more than we think. We have a lot more potential inside us that we don't realize. You know, I unlocked potential in myself the hard way. I was forced into realizing uh, by having to prove myself to get back to normal that, you know, I could go on and do more. I would never have seen, had that, that motivation and seen that potential in me had I not lost my legs. So the third point would be, you know, realize and use the potential that you have and don't wait to be you know, forced into it. Some great nuggets of advice there. What's the next chapter hold for you, Paul? The next chapter, I've got very, very busy. Uh, the, the publicity surrounding the book has produced a lot of bookings to work with companies and speak at seminars and uh, events and that type of thing, and I love that work. So I see a very busy uh, six months to a year ahead of, of, of that type of work combined with the more steady bread and butter work with with other clients that I work with and uh, a busy year ahead all round. Well, Paul, it's been a very inspirational interview. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for coming in and speaking to us this morning and I wish you every success with Small Steps. You're listening to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick in association with Wexford Insurances. Think Wexford Insurances for your business insurance.